Chapter 83 Justice versus Process Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 14 and 15 Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren, or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and tendeth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 and 15 When I was a boy, this law was still commonly applied to farm labour, where short-term jobs were involved, such as pruning, picking fruit, turning raisin trays and the like. Farm workers were paid daily. School children from neighbouring farms were paid when the work was done because their parents wanted the wages in a lump sum to be saved. This was ended when federal laws required taxes to be withheld, forms to be filed, and work permits for children and teenagers to be secured. Payments then was by checks. In some areas, minority peoples would refuse a job if the pay were not in cash. A centuries-old practice was ended when, for taxing purposes, statist intervention governed the employer and worker. We can assume that abuses existed under the old system. All the same, the worker was usually free to leave one farmer for another, and he often did so. This law appears also in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13. The hired man's capital was his ability to work. His major asset is abused whenever an employer can postpone payment because postponement means that the settlement of the account occurs when it is too late to act against it. The phrase in verse 15, at or in his day, means the day of his labour. A deferred payment means the depersonalization of a man and his work. Under the present system, neither the employer nor the worker control both the character of the work and its pay, and both are harmed thereby. When the Roman Empire took over Judea and Galilee, its centralised authority made it easier to overlook this law. As a result, the wealthy, both Jews and aliens, were able to use the fact that Roman law now took priority over God's law to exploit workers. The brother of our Lord, James, gives us a clear statement of the evil that resulted. Go to now, ye rich men, and weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the labourers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. James prophesied judgment on these peoples, and it came in the Jewish Roman War, AD 66 to 70. He sees their costly garments, their gold, and their silver as worthless against their day of condemnation, and their assets will eat their flesh like fire. They would be the especial target of the vengeful and conquering Romans. Their sin was postponing payments until protests by the workers would have no effect. God hears the cry of these poor because he is a compassionate God. Laws manifest a theology. Wherever we find law, we find there also a doctrine of community and of ultimacy. What and who is ultimate is always revealed by a body of laws. Biblical law manifests the God of justice and grace, 
of mercy and wrath, as we read in the Ten Commandments. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. God's judgments and grace are tied together as aspects of his justice and care. The poor are told to look to God rather than to man for justice. Many commentators, because of their modernism and their evolutionary perspectives, are convinced that this law, Deuteronomy as a whole and most of the Pentateuch, were actually written centuries after the time of the Exodus and of Moses. Their premise for this is evolutionary. They cannot believe that as far back as Moses' day, such, quote, advanced end, quote, thinking was possible. Because of their Darwinian belief, men back then were, for them, still semi-brutish, and wisdom was born only as man reached some proximity to the Greeks and Romans. But morality is not a product of evolution, but of a true and regenerate religious faith. If we begin on Darwinian premises but fail to recognise the possibility of devolution as a companion to evolution, we will then be forced to believe that history goes onward and upwards. Man is moving to Tayard de Chardin's Omega Point. It is advancing because evolution, by definition, means an advance. In terms of evolutionary theory as applied to the Bible, neither its supernaturalism nor the morality of the law is possible. It is held that a slow, developing humanity by expediency, trial and error or tyrannical imposition acquired its moral and legal framework, that no supernatural revelation is possible because power evolves from below, not from above. Another aspect of this law is cited by Matthew Poole, namely, justice must not be denied or delayed. Any delay in justice, whether in the courts or in daily life, is morally wrong. The nature of the political process in our time is alien to a quick justice or to justice at all. It should be apparent by now that all law has a source and a context. Its source can be the state, or it can be God. Its context can be a state bureaucracy or a godly community and the kingdom of God. Law rests on certain presuppositions. At its extremes, this can be the natural goodness of man, or it can be the total depravity of man. If man is naturally good, then his institutions, the state and its bureaucracy, are also good and can be trusted with power. If man is fallen and sinful, then neither he nor his institutions can be trusted, because sin permeates all things. God's law alone can be valid, and a decentralization is necessary in society to preserve it from tyranny. The rise of modern tyranny has accompanied the belief in man's goodness, as it did with Renaissance humanism. This does not mean that decentralization eliminates tyranny, far from it. Evil seeks power on all levels. A decentralized society at least limits the scope of evil. Apart from regeneration, it is always there and triumphant. With regeneration, its scope is progressively limited and it is placed under control. There is also the time factor to be considered. Delayed justice undermines law and justice alike. Justice is then delayed with an endless process. Men condemned to be executed for their crimes are still sitting in jail cells 10 and 15 years later, pursuing continuing and repetitive appeals when there is no reasonable doubt as to their guilt. The appeals are usually based on the technical details of their conviction. 
The requirement that there be justice is subordinated to the demand that the process be observed rigidly. We have, clearly, an inordinate faith in the legal process rather than in justice. It is not unreasonable to insist that this too is an aspect of the Darwinian worldview. Evolution replaces the creative act of God with an endless process and, since Darwin, the world has enthroned process over justice. It would appear that faith in justice has given way to faith in process.